to D and D Beyond. We are so excited. I'm so excited today. I'm just going to assume that I speak for everyone when I say that we are very excited because we get to sink our teeth into some new unearthed arcana today. But before we get to that, my name is Amy Dallin, and I am welcomed by Michael Galvis and returning guest and champion Riley Silverman. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm good. How are you today? I like that I'm a champion. I'm a fan of that. Yeah, I just get to declare that. No one can actually stop me, as it turns out. So canon. Fan of it. Um, and I'm going to compliment Michael because I believe it's contacts day one. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'm so stoked. I keep trying to adjust my glasses that uh, are not there. <laughs> Well, speaking of amazing upgrades, uh, we get to look at some wonderful new material today. It's been an incredible couple of days where we've had new book announcements yesterday and today, and this morning's was Strixhaven, a curriculum of chaos, which is going to be a book set in the Magic the Gathering setting of Strixhaven on the plane of, is Arcavius? Arcavios? It's- Arcavius, yes. One of it's those. A, it sounds like it has a like a D in there, but- it's, it's a little, it's a little <laughs> I forgot to check how to pronounce it, but it is a magical school and the mages of Strixhaven in Magic the Gathering have a bunch of different colleges with different specialties that pertain to the color combination. So we've all been wondering what might that look like if it came to Dungeons and Dragons. And as of today, we have at least some ideas of how that might go, because this morning we got Unearthed Arcana for mages of Strixhaven. Now this, of course, as always, is playtest material. This is for everybody to try out at their tables, send your feedback to wizards, and as usual, some version of this may or may not show up in a future book. Um, and you know, we know that Strixhaven is coming, so I certainly hope that some version of this is showing up, but as usual, we'll find out exactly what that looks like when it gets here. So, Mages of Strixhaven introduces something I'm very, very excited about, which is not just new subclasses for Dungeons & Dragons, but flexible subclasses for Dungeons & Dragons, which is what? Was anybody ready for this? Multiple classes can take these majors, enroll in these colleges, and choose these subclasses. Uh, there are five to choose from, and there are different magical classes different magic using classes that can use them i've been monologuing i'm just very excited so first of all first reactions on arcana mages of strixhaven riley i really like this idea of the flexible subclasses like you said because i think that a huge thing that that watsi has been going towards in this last kind of generation of books is this customization of character concepts and We've seen a lot of stuff like with the way that you can customize your origin of your character with Pasha's. And we've also seen there are a lot of subclasses that already kind of have a similar flavor to other subclasses that are more attuned to a specific class. Like we've seen like the Storm Barbarian versus the Tempest Cleric. So you can kind of have this crew of like stormy, stormy little sailor boys or girls and, and others as well, uh, <laughs> if you want. But like, you, but, but they're all still defined by their main class. And so I like this idea of being like, oh, I like the idea that like maybe my subclass can have powers that aren't defined by the main flavor of my magical like class that I've got. So I think there's some really appealing things to that where it's like, oh, maybe like I like the idea that you could play the same subclass as a wizard or as a bard. And it's a little bit different based on the flavor you're bringing to it. And yet, the abilities are still there. The only the, the the downside of it I can see as a player is if you're trying to run a let's say trying to run a Strixhaven campaign and like what if your players are all like oh we all want to be part of Lorehold like we all want to be <laughs> members of this same college well now you've got a bunch of players like are all these players going to have this same set of abilities in which case then you start to run into like oh well now our game feels really unbalanced or repetitive or redundant so that's like the only thing I could see I'm curious moving forward if like you have to take these subclasses if you're part of this college or if it's just like hey some members of the college have this subclass but like let's say like lorehold for example like maybe you could still be a college of lore bard within lorehold um so that's my that's my gut reaction we'll get into more stuff as we go on but that's that's like my multiple throwing hands in the air as i talk uh <laughs> list of things those are those are my initial reactions to it all right michael first thoughts 
Um, I was actually, when they first announced Strixhaven, I was like, I love this, but how the heck are you going to make this work with people actually attending these colleges? And I think, uh, I, I think you really hit on some really good points, Riley, because yeah, I, I'm a, I do worry about that redundancy. And it's like all, each of the colleges in Strixhaven are in very different sort of areas. So I'm curious how, like, if you have a campaign, then you're going to be having your characters, like, your player characters are going to be kind of separated. And then, like, how do you bring them together? Um, but overall, like, I going through these subclasses, I am so stoked. Um, I'm very curious, like, if they're going to introduce feats or something that, like, lets you have, like, a minor, maybe, in a different college. And then you get to kind of, <laughs> Double like... Double majors, minors, transfer yeah. students. I have so many questions. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you gotta just pack in, get 20 credits a semester to get that double major. <laughs> <laughs> no one here is a giant nerd who can relate to those things. Uh, no, we I all do, can. I... <laughs> oh, you, were being, you were being facetious yeah. and, I didn't, and I didn't hear the tone, I apologize. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sorry, bubbling over with excitement just because I think this is so neat. Um, and I do like the way that while I have questions, obviously, we're all sort of wondering if you play in Strixhaven, like, are you all magic users? Is there a way to roll other kinds of folks in? But even within that, I think that the flexible subclasses was a genius way to approach the idea of the different schools so that if you do, let's say, want to make a, a bunch of people all taking classes together in Prismari, you aren't all like as much flexibility as there is within a class, you expand that exponentially if you are are starting to be like well and this this maps to life right like i studied theater and within the theater department you have like very introverted writers and very extroverted actors and the opposite sometimes um and set designers and a lot of different people who are looking at have different specialties within it or different approaches to it but who are all focusing on the same thing and coming at it from different directions and i think that that's beautiful because it also expresses and we'll see this when we get into the the particular builds they've gone with. But I know that, and Michael, you are my Magic the Gathering tutor here, but each of these colleges is founded on a tension between two opposing colors, right? In Magic the Gathering. Um, and yep, that's correct, yeah. So they've found ways to express that with the choices within each of these builds. Um, I am curious, the, the, the one thing that did jump out at me with flexible uh subclass assignments and and they're only limited flexible because there's certain classes that can take each one uh so like bards can be lore holder silver quill druids can be prismari or witherbloom sorcerers can be prismari or quandrix warlocks can be lore hold silver quill or witherbloom and wizards it looks like have the which makes sense the widest range here uh a lore hold prismari quandrix or silver quill um, and please catch me on that if I got some of this wrong, because I've just been making notes. But what's that was pretty odd. That, that was pretty, even if you're, even if you had one wrong, anybody who's coming after you right now can sit down yeah, for a second, because that was an impressive <laughs> rattle off. Well, and we have uh, one, one quirk that's going to arise as people test this on their tables is that those different classes will grant you more at uh, uneven levels, if that makes sense. So bards, I believe your colleges are going to give you things at three, six, and 14. Uh, druids are going to be 2, 6, 10, and 14. Sorcerers, 1, 6, 14, and 18. Warlock, 1, 6, 10, and 14. Wizards, 2, 6, 10, and 14. And that's something I've never noticed because I'm usually not climbing multiple trees at once. Um, I don't do a lot of multi-classing. I probably should. Uh, but it's going to be an interesting thing to see play out with these because that's why they've worded a lot of these subclasses to be like you may have to choose between some options when you hit those benchmarks but they're balanced of course against the other things that you can do as any of these five incredibly cool and powerful spell casting classes um and speaking of those exciting things let's get into the actual colleges so michael would you tell me what's lore hold Oh gosh. Okay. So Lorehold is your college for archaeologists, historians. This is the type of college where your students are born adventurers. You're going to be uh, unearthing artifacts, dungeon delving. Um, but the what at the core of Lorehold is there's a great respect for history and a, a lot of curiosity for that history. So um, you know, setting wise. Lorehold is built into the side of like 
cliff sides and it has like these really dangerous bridges to cross when you need to get to class. Um, as a subclass, I this is such a great pet class and I was actually pretty surprised by how much they leaned into uh, these sort of like living statues that you can create. So there's, let's get specific because I wrote ancient companions in all caps when I was going through this, because if you are a mage of Lorehold, <laughs> you are going to pick up the ability to enchant slash summon the spirit of, uh, and, and some ancient source of wisdom to be a little living statue, medium sized living statue and follow you around and help you with things. And I, I'm, I'm so enchanted by this. Like what? Tell me more about how it works. Yeah, so uh, with the Ancient Companion, um, it works similarly to, you know, like an Animal Companion or your Steel Defender if you're an Artificer. Um, what I found, though, was that um, the Ancient Companion actually scales better than the Ranger's Animal Companion, um, although healing it is a little bit, works a little bit differently. You have to be expending spell slots to heal it. Um, but you also get these really nifty abilities with your ancient companion, you get to choose between three different types of ancient companions. You have, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the warrior, the healer, and the sage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Your the warrior gets higher AC and gets a really neat uh, reaction ability uh, that can help you with. I think it was dexterity and strength saving throws. Um, the sage gives you a plus two bonus to intelligence and wisdom checks while it's within i believe and like it's either five party, or 15 right? feet and yeah all pretty much anyway. the statue. <laughs> yeah which i was really surprised <laughs> by sage's council because I generally fifth edition kind of avoids numeric like flat numerical bonuses for the sake of like you know to avoid number crunching uh but i dig it i'm 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 down with sage's council uh, but he was like the favorite. idea that that means your statue is bossing everyone around the whole party. Yeah. They're like, mm, look that <laughs> They're just way. Correcting. I... You kids, you They're don't know how to you. dust for prints at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the fun part about this subclass is that literally the school will find a spirit and then they put it in a statue. And then the statue just kind of like is an actual person who existed at some point. Uh, and now they're, I don't know, you. You tell them to help you and to fight for you in combat. Uh, but I do want to touch on the healer. Uh, the healer is my favorite of the three types of ancient companions you can have. And that's because uh, you it can, is it a bonus action? Um, you use a bonus action to tell it what to do. But right. one of the and things then, it can do is, yeah. Right. And then it can give temporary hit points um, as one of its abilities, which is, just so good if you want to be uh, a support class or you just don't want to die. I like how mm -hmm. the three different types of, of benefits break down based on how they're used in situations too, like how the Sage is kind of out of combat, like it's for checks, how the Healer's Light is an action, and how the Warrior's Protection thing is a reaction. So it's like someone, you, you kind of do have to, based on how you decide to shape your companion, that shapes how you'll have to role play it moving forward, which makes sense based on your class and stuff like that, and your flavor. Absolutely. So the other side of Lorehold that I thought was very fascinating is that they, they lean into this time dimension. So not only can you get the wisdom of the past to help you out in your daily activities, but you just start, dipping into full-on chronomancy like uh the the higher level abilities start to actually lightly mess with time uh riley what was your favorite thing if, whether you want to lean into that or another element of lore hold um i would say i think that's what i had just i, I like the yeah the history like the the ability to pull from like because it's, it's a lore class right and that's like like i love i love how the college of lore in the bard college is all about like oh i've studied these things and i've learned these secrets or whatever but i like how this one makes it like no the secrets themselves are the power and i think that's a really fascinating way to look at it so that was my that's kind of what jumped out at me as well is the is the fact that like the literal like elements of history are infused with these bits of of like legendary power and like that kind of is a really interesting thing because it kind of plays into that element of like stories giving you power and, and like moving you forward and stuff like that 
Absolutely. So Mage of Lorehold is available to Bards, Warlocks, and Wizards are the three groups. Um, and I can, I think, Riley, you touched beautifully on the way that this plays into existing structures for Bards, um, which is one of those, like, when you think about Bards, you wouldn't necessarily be like, ah, oh, yes, rumpled archaeologists. But the connection that you're just drawing, they absolutely drawing your strength from the secrets of the past and that knowledge uh, is a, an amazing tie in to the way that being a bard mage of Lorehold would work, especially when you're like, <laughs> you're already a talkative bard and you've got a robot, uh, I keep saying robot, statue companion who's coming with you, who is then bossing you around. And you're like, uh, I, I'm just saying the role play opportunities for the mage of Lorehold characters are gonna be amazing because these are real ancient secrets who come from someone who had some kind of history until they uh, get demolished and you summon a new statue ancient companion. Uh, I wasn't clear from the read whether you can try to get the same person back the next day or not. I feel like maybe that's a table by table call. Um, <laughs> I, 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 love, I, love, I, love the, I love the idea of a DM be like, oh no, Dave's not available today. You want to talk to Frank? <laughs> Thanks here today. Thanks for being Dave is on um, sabbatical. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think uh, that plays into a lot of like prior to the like advent of the written word and prior to when common people had access to the written word, like words were very like in, in, in real history, like words were really important to class structures and power and also like historians you, you, know, you think about people like Herodotus who wrote like these like epic like s stories of like these like flowery like oral presentations of history I think that like plays into bards a lot in a, in a way the difference between information story and history is not one that has always existed as we understand it um those have often been blended or or just simultaneous uh and yeah. I love the way that 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 plays to that and also I'm saying Dan Carlin would just contract. rock it <laughs> sorry Say again I was saying Dan Carlin from hardcore history would just rock it in the college of Laurel that's all I'm saying <laughs> sorry I didn't mean to cut uh, you off to say that no that was perfect uh and eventually yes you do look up those higher level features because the war echoes history's whims uh give you some serious options uh for play in the College of Lorehold. So again, I wanna know how everybody's games with this go. Um, final question on Lorehold, because I'm just curious. In Magic, if I have this right, it's Lorehold College's colors are red and white. Um, yeah, you got it right. <laughs> and I know that like white is like structure uh, and peace uh, and red is, is some, some fiery energy. Um, but how would you sort of describe what red and white mean for Lorehold? And how do you think that connects if it does to this? Yeah. So the way I see Lorehold is that it takes the sort of selflessness that the, the white color of magic has, uh, with the sort of orderly organization that they have, uh, and then combines it with the, the raw emotion, the, uh, because red is, red is often, you know, People think of red as like, oh, burn magic. You're just going to like sling spells at my face. But it's really like an emotional color. Um, there's, a, there's a deep sense of like passion and drive to that color. And that's what I think it really brings to Lorehold and, and why I think this is like such a great color combination for uh, to bring to this UA. <laughs> cool. So emotion plus structure equals Lorehold. Um, Michael, I have a question for you about that. If you, if you know this regarding Strixhaven specifically in Magic, I've noticed like I haven't played Magic as the card game, but I have played in both of D&D's previously published Magic settings with Ravnica and with Theros. And I've noticed that with the guilds of Ravnica and the gods of Theros, like the color combinations are really important there too. But like in the guilds, there's like at least one guild for every possible color combination. And then with the gods of Theros, same thing, but also like individual gods that are just one color, like that they example, like, like I think, uh, like, uh, Thassa, the sea god is just blue, whereas other was like blue and white. And then on Ravnica, like blue and white is the Azorius and red and white is the Boros. Do you know why for Strixhaven, they limited it to only five colleges that are only like one set of combinations as opposed to having like a different college for each possible combination? Like, do they talk yeah, about so it at all? Yeah, so lore-wise, uh, when the plane was first created, um, it actually clashed with another plane of existence. Um, and so the different mana that existed within each of the individual planes clashed with one another. And so Arcavius is kind of like, what would happen uh, with a plane if opposing color combinations actually were able to coexist? 
because often in magic history, you know, the, the opposing colors are just, you don't normally like mix those two in design, I guess. I mean, you definitely, they definitely have in more recent years, but like uh, typically when they had like multicolored cards, it was like they had specific, they, they did what's called the allied color. So like green and white, white and blue. Um, so within this plane, you have that clash. And then okay. um, from that clash, you had the Elder Dragons that were responsible for finding Strixhaven. Um, and they kind of came to believe that it was important to teach people how to use these two, these like opposing forces responsibly uh, well. And that's kind of like where the university comes from. Gotcha. So all the magic are all clashing man as opposed to ones that would be in harmony with each other, essentially. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry. Sorry to go on that nerd dive. I'm like, just very curious. I, I love that and would happily, like, if they do extension campuses and eventually add more, that'll be fine. But if I, like, only need to learn five for now, then uh, I'll take that as a starting point. Um, because I, <laughs> I'm, I'm very, like, they each have their own mascots. They've got all this, like, exciting flavor that I can't wait to get into. So speaking of being excited about things, uh, I immediately bonded to this next college. Um, and this one had some surprises for me, but I'm really interested in y'all's thoughts on this because next up is the Mage of Prismari. Uh, Riley, do you want to give us like a, a quick, what is Prismari? So but from what I, I'm not as, as, as deep in the lore as Michael on this one, but from what I understand, Prismari is a college that uses like, the power of creativity and creation to drive their magic. And it seems to be a lot of really elemental energy, especially, but it's a lot of like the fluid motion of like the way like dancers would move. And like, so in my mind, I'm thinking of like calligraphy and stuff like that and how like, I'm, I'm th I, I imagine I, what the image that popped in my head was in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, where she's like using the like calligraphy in the, the sand to like draw. And like, that's, part of her motions or whatever. That's what's popping in my head. Now, I might be wrong about that. Uh, and I'm, I'm a little bit prickly because I don't understand why bards are not included in this college. <laughs> but Michael, if I, am, if I am missing the mark in a little bit, feel free to fill in my dot. No, I think you definitely hit the mark when it comes to the Prismari. They're all about, they bring in the, the sort of emotion and the, the chaoticness of red magic with uh, the very thoughtful, very meticulous practice uh, this practice i don't know of, of blue <laughs> magic so that's where you see here that, where you have like these students who are very just like i just want to i just want to feel my emotions but then you also have the artists who are like no like i'm going to perfect this one technique over the years that i'm attending this college i love this because i so I, one reason i was also surprised where i was like oh it's not farts because when i heard the description of the prismari i was like theater kids i get it um, exactly uh, yeah <laughs> but <laughs> Having also been a dancer, like I love the way that Prismari plays to that that tension, which is in some ways a false tension uh, between technique and expressiveness. Um, because of course, as you know, like artists who are sort of at the peak of their abilities are always drawing on both of those things. Um, but trying to find a way to be like, yes, your raw passion and your studied technique combined to to power what you do is one of those things that sounds amazing, but I sit there being like, how would you turn that into game mechanics? And I will say, I'm very impressed with how they turned that into game mechanics because it looks like, as Riley said, they leaned really hard into the elemental side of this um, and expressiveness, especially in what I love that you called that because I was also thinking in terms of dance dimensions um, for the abilities of the major Prismari. This one's available to druids, sorcerers, and wizards. And I feel like pinging those elemental abilities made me be like, oh, right, that's why it's druids and not bards. Um, because you're you're drawing on those natural powers. I mean, you know, I'm not going to stop your home table from doing whatever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think maybe but, I'm coming uh, from a place of like, as I've played a bard, I actually had a bard that I, I was, because I was on a stream and I wanted to add a visual element to things. Instead of me singing, I did her spell casting with fan dancing. And that was like okay. an element. So I guess that's why I am like, I could easily see this working for bards, but you know. Maybe, maybe this, maybe it's gonna be something that after the UA gets through. Maybe enough people will say, "Why aren't bards in the <laughs> creative arts school?" Like, it'd be like, maybe it's a, "Hey, it's a let's, double let's major open up thing. It's in a minor New York, situation. But no musical theater." <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> uh, so 
the things you can actually do with Major Prismari, uh, it will immediately grant you the two things, uh, creative skills and kinetic artistry. So as opposed to some of them that start you out with a spell list, your creative skills are going to give you proficiency in two skills among acrobatics, athletics, nature, and performance, which is a nice hint at the sort of things that you're going to be doing as a Major Prismari. Um, and then you're going to pick up these... Uh, these these features that will enhance uh, essentially your movement and elemental abilities. Um, and was there anything that jumped out at people from within these that you're particularly excited to see in motion? Michael? I really <laughs> like the kinetic artistry. Really? And, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I think it's no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm the worst today. I'm the worst. Go ahead, Michael. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was, I, I was actually going to commend you on that pun, uh, Amy. I, I did catch that one. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I so the creative skills I get it I I feel like this uh this subclass is desperately needing subclass spells especially uh like if you're gonna bring in I I think the reason they left out bard is because bard just doesn't have a lot of elemental spells to play with but if you add it in the subclass spells then you can uh drop them in um but out of I've got two artistry, I already go on this uh, on Earth Arcana. <laughs> I will play at both of your tables. Uh, <laughs> but I I'm just giving you giving you stuff. Keep going. Um but I love the the one that stood out for me for the kinetic artistry was the thunderlight jaunt. Uh, so you take on a nimble lightning form until the end of your turn you can move through the space of other creatures and you do not provoke opportunity attacks. If you end your turn inside a creature's space, you're pushed into the nearest unoccupied space. So this is a really great way um, because you you also get the ability to dash as a bonus action. It's just a great way to, if you're uh, a, not a very hardy spellcaster, to just get out uh, without, you know, having to cast your your Misty Step. And you don't have to worry about um, having to cast Expedious Retreat to really move around the battlefield. I will say I'm I'm very much imagining, and possibly this is Riley's fault for putting Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon in my head, but what about a monk who ends up multi-classing into something uh, that gives them Mage of Prismari, and it's just sort of flowing in and out, striking damage everywhere they go, and then dashing away. Um, I'm just saying. Uh, I, I really liked Favored Medium from this one, which was the level six feature, uh, which means you've honed your forms of elemental expression to best suit your ideas. I love the way that Medium, because Prismari is supposed to be both the visual arts, which could be painting, could be a lot of things. Um, this one leans towards motion, but uh, uh, at that with that feature, you get to choose a damage type that you gain resistance to because you're just sort of specializing. And I don't know, I just like the idea of instead of having a favored terrain being like, this is my element, literally I'm in my element. Um, and uh, additionally, when you cast a spell using a spell slot that deals the chosen damage type, you emit a spectacular aura of artistry, which extends five feet from you in every direction, not through total cover, lasts till the end of your next turn. And within that aura, any creature of your choice has that same resistance. Um, to that chosen damage type as you shape your favored elemental medium around them. Uh, it's just neat and very flavorful. And I got excited. And Riley, now I'm, I'm being terribly rude. What was your fave out of Prismar? No, you are fine. Um, I think I like focused expression. I like the idea. And I, I'm, I'm kind of a fan in general of all the fire elements in each little bit of subclass. I think it's, this is the ridiculous, I'm thinking about, this is so random, but there's that Simpson Streetcar Named Desire episode or Streetcar Named Marge. And there's like that speech that when John, John Lovitz is the guest star, it's like, you're all going to turn into white hot fires of pure entertainment, except for you. And, I, and that's the, and like, so I'm just imagining this idea of a character who is just like so caught up by the passion of dance and just burning it up around them. And I'm, I, I'm imagining that. I'm, I, I keep just pulling references, but I'm thinking about like a Moulin Rouge during the, the Roxanne number and just how like much passion is in that dance and the tango. So I feel like I especially love how the fire one creates this flame. But what I like about it is that it also gives somebody around you um, hit temporary hit points. I like the idea that like you are focusing the flame, but you're also using the flame to protect those you care about. And I, so I like that, like that, like kind of two sides of it aspect. Cause I think flame is often really presented as this destructive uh, chaotic element, but I think that there is real power in controlling flame. It's why it's kind of the historic reference to humanity gaining knowledge, right? Humanity learning right. fire from Prometheus. Like that's that is where we get the idea of flame. So 
if you take flame as like a way of like inspiring and building, it's good to see a subclass feature that actually allows flame to be used in such a way. That's a I think, great uh, kind call. Of adding on to that folks uh, with focused expression, if you do go sorcerer, you could pick up the the transmute the transmute spell uh, meta magic from uh, the sorcerer class, and you basically just get to pick whichever effect you want by changing uh, the damage type of your spells. So that's kind of like a neat little combo if you were to go prismari sorcerer for this. It's the end of-